All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us again for 60 Minutes of Unscripted.net Entertainment. Uh, as doctors of .net, we prescribe healthy choices in .net. I'm your host, Luis, and with me are my co-hosts, Cam, and yes, I got it right, David. <laughs> and uh, wait, wait, today, wait, 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 put, put, put you on the spot. Which way is David? Uh, hold on. No, yeah, yeah, I got it right. <laughs> yeah, you read it the first <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, right. My right, your left. All right, there we go. Um, with us today is Pete, who's going to talk to us a little bit about Azure Percept. I'm sure I get that right. I always get that confused. So Azure Percept. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about I IoT this month, so we're just going to keep the ball rolling and uh, continue with IoT. So, Pete, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I mean, this kind of melds its way into your next month's topic of ML as well, doesn't it? To a degree, it's a, a, a combination of the two. But uh, yeah, hi, I'm Pete Gallagher. Uh, I'm a, a Azure MVP and Microsoft Certified Trainer and Pluralsight author and freelance programmer. So I keep myself busy. Uh, and yeah, I'll be talking about Percept um, and home automation today. So it should be cool. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally don't know much about it, so I'm really looking forward to this episode and, and learning a little bit more. Um, so with that, uh, maybe we should get to our, our doc, checkup doc. We All shared right. the wrong screen. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, that's the wrong one. That, that, that's the one we wanted. Th this is the one we wanted. This is the one. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go over the checkup doc. It's a rather short doc, admittedly, but uh, luckily we have an expert with us who's going to walk us through all of the, the moving parts. So Azure uh, Percept, it's actually a family of hardware, software, and services designed to accelerate business transformation using IoT and AI at the edge. So that's a lot of words and a lot of moving parts, and uh, it includes artificial intelligence and IoT and things of that nature. So it's like, oh my God, there's so many things. What are we supposed to do? What is it? You know, who's going to make sense of it all? Uh, luckily, we've got Pete with us. So, uh, so there's a couple primary challenges that are you're you're faced when attempting to deploy to the edge, uh, and you know, rather than you know summarizing those, uh, you can you know follow the Aka link that we had shared before. Uh, but a lot of this is based around um, the Azure Percept DK, which is the development kit. And it is available, I believe. Um, and it's 349 US dollars, 349 bucks. So uh, Pete, do you have one of these or yes. several yep. or 10 yeah. or like 500 of them? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I just went in the warehouse and somebody left it open. I just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's really it at, at this point in terms of the, the checkup doc. It's, it's rather short and sweet, um, but this episode will serve as more of a deep dive into what does this all mean? And uh, luckily, we've got Pete here who's going to walk us through all of it. Awesome. And there we are. We're not right screen now. That's that's the right one. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, thanks very much uh, for the intro. Uh, yeah, a few um, uh, bits of information there that I'll I'll come back to as I go through this talk. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, the percept and, and home automation. I've not got all that many slides, just enough to be able to illustrate the bits that, that we're going to talk about and give you a bit more of a better picture. Um, I've already spoken about who I am. Uh, so yeah, I'm Pete Gallagher, um, and uh, I'm not going to spend too long on this screen because I've done that. Uh, but I do run a, a few meetups, and um, we, I've got a Twitch uh, channel and show as well. So uh, I'll mention those again at the end. Uh, but yeah, the Percept, and you saw on that uh, on that short docs uh, page there that this is a, a great way to get to a proof of concept with AI at the edge. So it, it couples together a bunch of software, Azure services, and some Microsoft hardware. Um, the Azure services are pretty much grouped into the speech services. So we've got text-to-speech and speech-to-text and then natural language understanding, Lewis. Um, and then uh, there's a nice piece of uh, software as a service called Speech Studio that couples all of that into a nice project that we can deploy down to the Percept. Um, most of this developer kit is driven by, or it's, it's brain is, if you will, the carrier board, as it's called. And the carrier board has got IoT Edge on it. 
uh, which is uh, just really a Docker engine uh, running on the Edge device that allows it to run workloads, uh, in this case, AI workloads at the Edge and communicate up to Azure. Uh, and then there on the right-hand side is Custom Vision. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on the Custom Vision side, uh, but I will give you um, a demo of how that works and show you that um, just so that you can flesh out the detail in your, in your head there a little bit. Uh, the hardware, um, we've got uh, the carrier board that I mentioned and the vision module and the audio module. So they kind of look like this. The production ones might be black. That's probably about the only difference. And I think they're made by Acer. Um, that, on, carrier board, uh, that carrier board reminds me of like one of the first cell phones I'd ever seen, like the, <laughs> yeah. the giant antennas. And, and so what's the range on that? Um, do you know offhand, like what, how, how far does that thing transmit? No, but a good deal of distance. So if you've got like a, a, a ubiquity router or something like that, I'm betting it will have a similar range to that with those two wow. giant antennas on there. So um, yeah, it would, it will easily be able to pick up the Wi-Fi because I mean, that's kind of really what, what it's there for. It does right, everything right. as well, um, but um, they're really relying on those two giant antennas that you've got on the back there. Um, it's got um, a nice healthy processor in there as well. So, I mean, this is going to outperform something like a Raspberry Pi, uh, but maybe sort of on par with something like a Jetson Nano or uh, a Xander or something like that. So this is designed for, for AI workloads at the edge, which take a bit more power. Um, it actually runs Linux and Microsoft's flavor of Linux there, Mariner. Um, and under that then, on top of that essentially, is uh, the Azure IoT Edge runtime. Uh, which is coordinating all of these little Docker containers or modules, as they're called. Uh, and there's various modules in there for the, the different AI workloads and also the communication back up to Azure. Uh, all of this is actually driven by something called Percept Studio, uh, which we'll look at in a little minute. Um, the uh, Vision module, again, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that, but that's got an 8 megapixel camera. Uh, capable of capturing at 30 frames a second. It's got a 120 degree field of view as well. So uh, pretty good. Uh, and that relies on a service called Custom Vision, which I mentioned there earlier. Um, and what's great about all of these services are is that they're, they're code free. So you can get going with them without needing to, to do any coding, no ML knowledge at all. Um, just the basic docs will get you started with this, which is great. So I have a question real quick. I wanted to go back okay. to the, the Vision one. So. Yep. For those who are watching, first of all, if you're watching live, I, you know, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we would love to interact and, and address those here, but I did have a question right away. So uh, with Vision specifically, what are some of the common use cases for something like this? Like IoT on the edge, you have this thing way out somewhere sitting, you know, literally on the edge of like maybe like a building or something like that. Like what, what's a common, you know, use case for this? There's, there's some really great ones, actually not not even outside, although I've got a particular affinity with the outside. I'm doing some work with people that are in the ecology sector uh, in wildlife protection and things like that. And so this actually doesn't lend itself all that well to something like that, uh, because if you imagine if you're in the middle of an African like uh, uh, savanna somewhere, um, there's not a great deal of power usually, and this is power hungry. So, but that's kind of not the point of this hardware. And um, I, I, when I spoke to Microsoft about it, and I said, "Oh, it's a reference architecture," but no, oh, no, 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 don't call it a reference architecture. It's not that. Uh, and in fact, none of this hardware is open source either. Um, so the point of the hardware is to get you to a, a point of um, I know how to to use the Azure services and the Edge services together, and then I can deploy them onto whatever platform I like that supports that. Um, and yeah, there's heaps of support. But onwards from that, I mean, you could have this on a production line, and it could be looking at uh, items that you're manufacturing and looking for defects. And so that's a really good example. So you could teach it that you know this is a vase and this is what it's supposed to look like, and this is a vase when it's been broken, and you can tell me about that. Um, Cliff Aegis, a uh, good friend of mine, he's building his own plane. Uh, a sling, something or other. Um, he's a pilot for BA, so it's not as surprising as it sounds, actually. Uh, but this is a small, light aircraft. And what he's done is taught it to recognise the parts for his aircraft. So instead of him having to like make sure he doesn't lose the pieces of paper that come with the parts, he can hold up an individual part and it will tell him exactly what that part is. Um, and so, I mean, that, that's just some basic examples. Once you've got... Well, yeah, I was just going to say, got, like, yeah. I mean, you just kind of breeze past the, 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 you know, the fact that it's not that surprising. Like, I know other pilots and none of them are just like, yeah, I'm building a plane. <laughs> 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 Yeah, fair. Maybe if you knew Cliff, it wouldn't be that surprising. <laughs> this guy's awesome. 
Uh, but I mean, yeah, it's not just, I, I wouldn't consider building a plane. Well, I'd build it, but I, I wouldn't be flying in it afterwards, I can tell you that. <laughs> At least Cliff will know if it's not right or not. <laughs> right, right. You'll know on the first flight, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How's it going, Cliff? Cliff? <laughs> ah, damn it. New co-host. <laughs> one, one of the things that, that you sort of brought up here um, that, that I, it was actually a you know, question of mine is, uh, this looks like it, it has a lot of, you know, it's resource hungry. Um, so for those scenarios, right, that are just, you know, you don't have a lot of power, you don't have a lot of resources, um, would you say that this would be a, a good solution for it or not? Or are there workarounds? Um, uh, if you, I mean, if you're talking about using like a low power Arduino, uh, then this specifically wouldn't. I mean, all of the Azure services, you can run them in the cloud directly rather than at the edge. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the beauty of having it at the edge, of course, is that you cut out that cloud loop. So if you imagine if you're looking at a lathe, for instance, and, you, and you're looking at whether or not it's, it's broke, you don't want to have to wait for it to go to the cloud to tell you that. You need to, to, to stop that machine immediately before it hurts itself or somebody else. Um, so, yeah, it's not great if you want... I mean, as I mentioned, in the middle of the African savanna, for instance, I mean, that's not perfect for something like this. You need something that can be powered from solar. So you can, at that point, um, use an Arduino and perhaps um, uh, a lighter AI workload um, at the edge instead of all of this processing power. Um, but um, even that might not be ideal. It just depends on what you want to do. Communications can be one of the biggest problems. So if you wanted to use the, the Azure um, stack to do this, the AI workloads in, in Azure, and you're using something like LoRaWAN, then uh, that's not going to be great uh, because you can get like, what, 4K a second or something across LoRaWAN. It, it's that or thereabouts. So that's not perfect. So I mean, you, you do have to consider where you're going to put these things. Um, but if this is just going to sit on a factory floor, plugged into the mains with a nice either hardwired or decent Wi-Fi connection, perfect. Not mega cheap, though, as you pointed out, $339. I mean, you can do this cheaper. You can do this with a Raspberry Pi, uh, although you can't run those AI workloads on a Raspberry Pi, um, sadly. So then you've been to TensorFlow or something like that, or as I say, custom vision in the cloud. And, and your range with the Raspberry Pi, like the Wi-Fi on those, the range is not nearly as good as those giant antennas. So that actually brings up a question. We had uh, Car Cod ES uh, from Twitch is asking, are there any ways to connect this to a wider area network, something like LoRaWAN? Yeah, um, yes, really what you want then, of course, is a LoRaWAN gateway of some sort um, to be able to communicate out and then uh, a LoRaWAN transmitter. Uh, receiver module connected to that so i mean you're outside of the scope of what we're doing but it's got all of the necessary bits and bobs on there if i go back i don't know if i've mentioned on there about the fact it's got gpio as well um can, uh, can, can we define laura one yeah so laura one is a, a really low power uh wide area network um, and it can go miles if you've got the right conditions. But as, as I say, it's really low power, really low speed because of that. And it's great for um, like battery operated or solar operated uh, workloads where really you're sending messages over that. You can send images, but geez, it takes a while to do that. And the image quality is not going to be great. Um, so ideally, you'd have a different form of communication for something like that. But yeah, low power, wide area. Radio. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I've not mentioned GPIO on there, but um, this thing, although there doesn't appear to be a great deal of detail in the docs about it, I'll keep looking down here because I've got the percept all set up uh, down on my desk uh, and you'll see the, the camera I've got pointed at it uh, a bit later on. So, yeah, you can. Uh, you can do what you like. It runs um, IoT Edge modules. So you can you can put whatever workloads you want onto this thing. Uh, put your own code on it, um, expose whatever you like out of it. That's what's great because it sort of gets you past that hardware section to a degree. Um, uh, you, know, you know that all of these AI workloads are just going to work with it. You don't need to go through that, ah, oh, geez, you know, compile your own uh, Docker containers and, and then the drivers don't work and did the wrong camera. And yeah, that, that's the beauty of it for POCs like this. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. So uh, moving on. Um, we, we we spoke briefly about that uh, the vision module, the sound module, which is what I'll be using for for the demos today. And I've got a few of those. I'm very brave. I tend to like to do uh, live demos of IoT stuff. Uh, but this um, has got four microphones in it, a microphone uh, array of four microphones there, and a three and a half mil audio jack, and then a processing unit to be able to 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 then feed that information to the carrier board. 
Uh, and this relies then on Speech Studio and the Azure Speech Services, uh, text to speech, speech to text, Lewis and stuff like that. Uh, but again, all of that is is no code, uh, at least to get you going. It's no code. Obviously, once you start then wanting to plug in uh, extra bits into that to make it do things with Raspberry Pis, then you're going to need to have some code. But actually, when we look at it in a bit, there's not a great deal in there either. Um, and I've given it all. It's all on GitHub, so uh, you'll be easily able to get started on that. Uh, did you want some demos? I could do some demos. So um, let me switch over to uh, my browser, which has gone all the way down to the bottom of the list now. So um, this is uh, Percept Studio. So this is where you're going to come to do most of your Azure Percept work. Um, and what's great about this is that there's a whole heap of demos and tutorials. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of those um, in a minute. But there's a section here for vision and a section here for speech, and you can try them out. Um, we can go to devices and we can see our device and all being well, it'll have my device listed and showing is connected. So that's the percept that I've connected up. Now, as I mentioned before, the carrier board is running Linux and IoT Edge, and that communicates up to IoT Hub, and that's what's underpinning all of this work here. Uh, so IoT Hub is allowing us to be able to communicate backwards and forwards to the uh, uh, the percept, and then obviously we have all of the other services that that we call into and feedback from uh, with various pieces of software. And, and sorry, and, and uh, oh. that communication is beyond just sending a request over to perform some prediction. It's it's also um, you know downloading whatever you know custom services or custom models you you want to load onto the model, right? Yeah, exactly. So when you first set this up, um, it's already got the wherewithal to be able to download. And as you've said, you have these what's called modules or Docker containers that allow you to, to run these workflows at the edge and it pulls them down automatically. So the IoT edge runtime on the, um, uh, the carrier module there, the carrier board, that's got IoT edge already set up to it. And once you, you plug those two, two things together, uh, which when you first turn your percept on, there's a whole setup uh, that you go through. It's not particularly complicated, but you register it to uh, an IoT hub, and then the rest of this happens automatically to a degree. Um, we probably won't have time to deep dive into all of that, um, but there are loads of blog posts out there um, that people have, have done the first thoughts, myself included, and Cliff Aegis, and check the tech community IoT blog out, and you'll find quite a few on there of that level of detail. Uh, but yeah, Again, the beauty of this is that a lot of it's just done for you to begin with. You don't need to worry too much about how it works until you start digging deeper. Uh, yeah, so that percept there, we can we can dig into that in a bit if we like. Uh, then we have these AI projects, and I've created a couple of AI projects here, uh, and then speech projects as well. I've created a few of those. Uh, on this particular page, this is where we have the keyword. And if you've ever used something like an Alexa, um, and uh, now we can say that other audio devices do exist uh, because the Percept is one of those, then you'll know that saying the word Alexa will wake that device up and then it's ready for a command. And that's what these keywords are. Uh, and so I've got three there. I'm not going to say the one in the middle because that will wake the thing up. Um, but that's that one in the middle there. That is what I've trained at the moment to, to allow it to wake up. So yeah, so vision here. Um, I've got a vision project. Now, if I switch tabs, this is actually the camera on the Percept. So uh, once you've got this set up, there's a web stream that you can go to that streams the live feed of the camera. But it actually also, the way I've got it set up and the way that most people will, I can set it up to recognize objects. So don't worry, I have a hammer. Uh, so I've set it up to, uh, to recognize the difference between a hammer and a screwdriver. So if I hover this over there, then if I get it in the right angle, then there we are. Uh, it's recognizing that that is a hammer. It's 70, 80% convinced that that's a hammer, which I think is actually not too bad, really. So that 0.8, that's just a percentage. That's the reason why it's reading is that. And it can tell the difference between that and a trusty screwdriver. So if I hold that over there, then it reckons that that's a screwdriver with 80% accuracy. So the way that's working, and I go to the next tab, is that uh, it uses custom vision. So custom vision is uh, a no code AI method of training AI models. So instead of needing to get into doing all the ML stuff, machine learning stuff yourself, which is pretty complicated, um, what you can do is you can set the percept to actually take photos from its camera module and upload them to this custom vision project that I've got set up here. And so it just sits there and you can set the time. I set it to five seconds originally. 
And then once you've, you're happy, you've got enough of these photos, you can go through and tag them. So if you click on them, you see I've already tagged these ones uh, and I've tagged that as a screwdriver. I've actually tagged the other things in here as well. I've actually moved this percept since um, and I'm, I'm quite impressed that it, it's interesting. The background has now changed essentially. So it knows what it's looking at, even though the rest of the context has changed, which sort of shows how, how uh, mature this product actually is already. Uh, but there's bit there and a worm, a Team 17's worm and a ring light and stuff like that. Uh, and really, you're going to need about ideally 40 images of each of the things you're going to tag. Uh, and so, I mean, I can click on hammers here and you can see all of the, the images that I've tagged with the hammer. Now, you've got to tag it with the hammer in different orientations. Even I've not been particularly good with the orientations on there, you can see. Um, actually, this difference between hammer and, uh, and screwdriver came from a, a talk that I gave quite a while back where there's, there was a, an MIT data set that somebody released specifically to fool AI. And uh, for that hammer, I mean, us humans can recognize hammers pretty easily uh, because, you know, you've got the claw on the back and the, you know, the wacky bit on the front there. Um, so that's great. But if you clip that claw off the back, even us humans would say, well, I'm not quite sure what that is anymore. So they'd put a hammer on a bed and it fooled all the AI. No AI recognized hammers at that point. Um, but again, you could train it with an image of the claw missing off the back and then that would fix that. But the point I'm making is, is that these things are biased automatically by the data set we put into them. So to undo that bias, um, you need more images. Quick question here, uh, Pete. Um, this vision uh, sort of module or this vision part of uh, Percept, um, is it any different or how does it relate to the Connect that I think was released a few years back? Is it, you know, similar? What are, you know, what are the differences? Yeah, we have, we've actually got more than one Connect as well, isn't there? There's, there was a Connect DK, um, which was sort of the most recent Connect. Uh, one of the, 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 uh, the selling points of the Connect though, was it had uh, depth perception and that doesn't, so this is a single lens at the moment. Having said that, there is a slot for a second lens and something may be coming for that second slot. Uh, what I want to see is maybe switch it up and maybe have a no IR or, or an IR or an uh, infrared or ultraviolet rather camera on there so that you could, you could do some depth then at that point. Um, so no is the answer not greatly re um, uh, related um, but that did have the facility built in to be able to do like skeletal detection and things like that which you can train this percept to do as well and I know um, in fact I think there's there's a uh, blog post on the IOT blog there doing exactly that so recognizing how people stand um, which is quite cool so yeah custom vision is pretty powerful and obviously, what, you don't just have to stick with custom vision. You can you can go down your own route and, and make your own vision workloads um, when you get confident enough. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to just stick in here because I'm no machine learning expert, data scientist. <laughs> so yeah, so that's cool. So that's that's the vision side. I like that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, again, you can do this in the cloud instead of using an edge device. You can do all of this on the cl in the cloud if you wanted to. Um, I know if you've got a Raspberry Pi that doesn't have quite enough power, then you can just send images or moving video up to the cloud and have it analyze it and return you the result. Um, and that'll work. It'll be slower, uh, but it'll work perfectly well. So obviously the beauty of having it at the edge is, again, you cut out that cloud loop. So so that's the, the vision side, and, um, and that's probably the last of the vision that you're going to see now. Um, but if I go back a tab over here, then um, in this, if I go to the overview, in fact, if I scroll down on demos and tutorials, then we've got these speech and demos um, uh, area here. And if I click on it, then we've got a few different scenarios, if you will. So you were talking earlier about where would we use this? Well, Microsoft have obviously thought about that, um, even though really when, when I think Microsoft don't want you to be thinking that, that this is it, uh, they really want this to be a really broad product. So, so don't think that this is, you know, the only places that they're expected to sell these. This is just to get you off that blank page. Uh, so there's hospitality, healthcare, inventory and automotive. And these just give you an idea of, of how you would control those and get feedback from those in the real world based on speech in this case. And I've deployed um, a hospitality demo. Uh, I'm not going to deploy that now because that would rely on Azure, but I do have it um, already running just here. 
and it's going to want me to refresh it, which is, of course, what it's going to do in the middle of the talk. Uh, but it's not uh, greatly difficult. Actually, this, this part would have been difficult up until yesterday when I figured out how to get around the problem of it um, and doing that. Getting back to that page, if you bookmark that page, it doesn't take you anywhere, sadly. So if you go into the device once you've deployed one of these uh, demos, and now we have to wait. This is the reason why I left it going, but I left it going too long. It's always the case, isn't it? Um, then if I go, this is information about the device here, by the way, and it looks like there's an update available. Uh, should I do it now, right in the middle of the talk? Is that a good idea? Can't Live on the edge, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the talk, isn't it? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, if I click speech here uh, and scroll down, then we can click this configure and test. So if you deploy one of these demos and you want to know how to get back, that's how you get back. So go back into the device and speech and you can click that link. Little tip. Um, so I've got my percept already set up down here. So actually I can show you that. There it is. So uh, I've got a camera pointed down at that. That's live at the moment. Um, and that's the, the carrier board, the vision module, the sound module, pair of speakers, which I will turn on uh, so that you can hear what it's doing. Uh, this, and then, real quick, real quick. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah the, of course. Yep. So first of all, that, that hardware is actually beautiful. I like the way it looks. It um, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the speakers, it, does that come with the Percept or is that just like an add-on little thing that you found somewhere? Yeah, no, I've had those for years. They're dead good, actually. So four uh, AAA batteries in the back and you get a good amount of bump wow. out of them. But, it actually looks um, like it's part of the, the yeah, yeah. kit. Yeah, it does. Somebody thought it looked like Johnny Five. <laughs> they were very disappointed when I sent them the speakers. <laughs> did you build Did you build that mount for, for the hardware yourself? or, no. or... Yeah, so, it's a dim so rail it... uh, right. across the back. comes with it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get bang for your book in the, I mean, this kit is awesome. Uh, so it's expensive for a reason. Uh, and obviously there's been a lot of development work had to go into this uh, to get it to work properly. Um, I say the production one's black and made by Acer, I think, or at least in the UK. And I think probably the US that might find it in different locales that would be different. But yeah, I prefer this silver one looks awesome. Uh, but black doesn't look too bad either. It's okay. Uh, but these these components stand out against this, that chrome, don't they? That silvery effect. So I like that. So yeah, so this is all set up. Those blue LEDs indicate it's waiting for that um, wake word. Uh, so over on here, you can see that custom keyword. Uh, and I can't zoom in because it's not very uh, responsive, this thing. So uh, apologies if the text is a little bit small, but really it's all about listening rather than seeing here. But uh, we have a list of messages on the left that it, it has understood and that it is that is given as a response. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a mock hotel room. And we're able to do various different things in this, like turn on the AC, turn on the television, the lights, uh, and things like that. So we can test that. Now, this is still relatively early days with this kit, so it doesn't always respond first time to the wake word. And so I find that sometimes I've got to say that more than once. So I'm not going crazy. Uh, it's just um, a bit slow sometimes. So um let's see what it says so controller controller turn the tv on okay turning the tv on and that's the tv turned on so i mean and that's cool all on its own but obviously i can do controller turn the bathroom light on sorry oh. i didn't quite catch that no. controller turn the bathroom light on Okay, turning on the bathroom light. And controller, set the room temperature to 70 degrees. Set temperature to 70. And you can see that's a bit hard to see. That's in the middle there on that little um, uh, thermostat on the wall. Um, and controller, close the blinds. All right, closing the blinds. Then you, that's a bit hard to see as well, but that's just those lights on the floor. You see where it's coming in through the window. Yeah, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, that's the actual percept um, working with this. Um, so it's not some trickery. Um, it's it's actually communicating from the percept up to all of these speech services uh, through the project that has been created for us in the background. I've not had to do any coding for this. I've just had to give it a name, essentially. Uh, and it spun us up something that we're, we're often running with. Um, sadly, the, the code for all of this isn't very accessible either. Uh, but... I'll show you how we can do that uh, with the real stuff. Um, 
So go yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, that was going to be my question. Uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, so like in this case, it's simulated, right? The simulated environment, it's still early days for the Percept. Um, but are there, you know, hardware partners such as, you know, light bulb makers or whatever, who are actually make it easy to integrate with the Percept? Uh, or is it sort of up to you uh, to sort of implement that connection between the smart devices and, and your Percept? I like that. Make the bed. Um, I wonder if I should do that. That'd be good. <laughs> uh, deliver me breakfast as well would be quite nice. Um, yeah. So uh, not not at the moment. Um, that's something I'd love to do, actually, is make some of those integrations. Uh, but there is a halfway house. There's if this, then that, if you've heard of that service. So this is a service where you can you can connect to it and other people have made integrations with stuff like that. And in fact, the talk I did with Paul DiCarlo, uh, demonstrated exactly that so Paul was sitting in Houston and I'm over here in the UK and he'd got a bunch of smart plugs and they happened to have an integration with if this and that um, and so we could turn his TV on and his AC on and and the lights from over here to over there just to, using that um, so little or no code involved in in making that work uh, which was cool uh, but I wanted to do it myself uh, so I did that's awesome. Yeah, I can just see Cam like swiveling in his chair because he just wants to say something about integration software here for IoT enabled <laughs> device. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm letting the guests talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you ask away. I'm happy with that. It's fine. No, no. This is this is just an area that I'm really into. So, so, and I'm looking to see where your demo takes it because I'm sitting here thinking like, okay. Um, like if if I were doing this, the way I would uh, like take this into the real world is I would use some sort of a I, I would either build a gateway or use some sort of a commercially available gateway to um, uh, to interact with like a Z-Wave or a Zigbee network. Yep, you can absolutely do that. Or you could do what I've done. Um, okay, <laughs> but that is definitely an option on the table. Um, yeah. So if I switch back to my slides. Da -da -da. And um, we go to the next slide, uh, then we could talk a little bit about how I've done it. So what I've built up, I'm looking to have a little spoiler there, but uh, I started out with the Percept, just as we've got, and then I've connected that out through speech, and that's kind of automatic, but I'll show you how that works. Uh, and then what I've done, I've gone out to an Azure function, and from the Azure function to IoT Hub, so back to the same IoT Hub the Percept's connected to, but I've registered another device, a Raspberry Pi, your gateway, if you will. Uh, but of course, you know, you could do this with uh, any gateway you like, so long as you've got connectivity to some service in Azure. You could go direct from the Azure function, if you like. But hey, we're doing IoT. We're going to go through IoT Hub, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, and then from the, from the uh, Raspberry Pi, I've just got a mains relay. And from that, I've hooked a lamp up. So uh, the, the next sort of image sort of, sort of shows you again what I was showing you on my, on my screen there. So all of this kit, and then you can just about see just here is a lamp. And then beyond that, I've got a robot arm, which has nothing to do with this talk. Uh, and then um, a Raspberry Pi connected to that and uh, a double socket. Uh, and in there, I've got a relay and I've connected that back out. So what's great about a mains relay, by the way, uh, just in case... Um, you've not used one before is that we can use standard logic level signals on one side and mains on the other so it's just going to turn a switch on or off using uh, the standard logic level signals on a raspberry pi in this case uh, and so i've got the whole plug turning on or off so you could plug whatever you want in there you could have your ac or you could have um a washing machine or you know any, any mains powered device on the other side actually the relay i'm using is yeah that just a four of one of those and that, an elgato one most likely is what you've got there um and yeah that's exactly what it is inside the box i've just got four times and i'm only using so, one of them <laughs> so funny story um I'm in Kansas City, Missouri, USA, and we had a software conference, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, our local regional developer conference this past week. And I did a talk there actually on um, well, my own IoT device. Lots of people have probably heard about it, my smoker. Um, and the uh, funny, funny thing, I was demonstrating how we could do exactly what you're going to do, you know, flip, you know, basically mains powered devices off and on with one of these things. Um, it was hot and I picked it up and I, I, I like right in the middle of the presentation, picked it up, put it down. Went, oh, yep. Yeah, that was 110. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that, that would be sore. Oh, man. Yeah, be careful. Um, and in fact, right at the very end of this, when I, uh, when I show you a little blog, I've got a massive black box with red writing, writing in it saying, if you are going to deal with mains, then you need to have a sensible adult next to you. Uh, so be careful, kids. Yeah, it, it's, it can kill you. So um, be be mega careful with this. I mean, as I say, I've locked all of mine away inside of a, a double patras here, so I can't kill myself, theoretically. Uh, but more that my kids can come into the office and I don't have to worry about them having problems. But yeah, wiring these things up, um, you know, just be careful. Um, it's simple. The, ele the electrics and the electronics are simple, but it's, it can be deceptive and you can lure yourself into a false sense of security. So, yeah, we can't take any responsibilities for any any issues that you might have. And you might say <laughs> instead of deceptive, it's perceptive. Oh, oh, right. How do you end my sleeve studio? That's the book. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm going to show you how I've done it with with those bits and bobs. So um, what I will do, where should we start? I'll tell you what, let's start in the browser. So uh, this is the, the hospitality demo back there again. I can actually change the custom command here. I'm going to do that, and then um, I'll explain what this custom command is actually doing. So uh, it's going to list me my available uh, custom commands, and the one I want is that one in there in particular. So I'm going to save that. Uh, and my LEDs will blink. Uh, I'm not fast enough to change tabs um, on my Percept. Now, actually, a lot of the speech stuff happens in the cloud uh, rather than on the Percept itself. Um, or at least that's my understanding of it. Um, I'm happy to be told that that's not quite correct. But the reason why I point that out is I think you still need the internet connection for the speech side. Uh, the AI vision stuff, there's there's a, definitely a module on there that can do that offline, but I think this needs to be connected to the net to do the speech stuff. But to be fair, all of this workload, you know, kind of needs that to a degree, but it would be nice if the internet was off, you could still turn your lights on and off. So Pete, real quick question. I wanted to interject here real quick. So you yeah. from the studio, right? This is a web browser. You, inside the studio, you flip a switch to where you're changing what was that you changed like the, the the model or like the the command right the custom yeah. command so right. what actually happens when you select yeah. a different command uh so i'll show you okay. so what we have is uh, you're going to use speech studio but actually you can't get to it from speech studio <laughs> uh because i think the reason is it's still in preview at the moment and while it's in preview this is all free uh which is nice so the, i think they've bypassed this to bypass the billing that's that's my guess anyway so you get to it from um from you from your uh, percept studio here uh but i've already got it open and all be well it will still be there and here we are so this is speech studio so uh if you've if you've sort of been listening to how this works we have this theory of of commands and you can have multiple commands in this speech studio i've only got one because all i'm doing is turning a light on and off now what you have to do is explain to speech studio and essentially then to all the services that are driving the percept, how you want to be able to tell it to turn those lights on and off. And it's not just light on, light off. There's all these different ways. And of course, that's just a subsection of all of the different ways you can turn them on and off. Turn the lights on, turn the lights on, lamp, turn the, you know, just lamp on. So you've got to give it a really good idea of, of how to do what you want it to do uh, after you've said the wake word, of course. Um, now, what you'll notice is that I've got these little green bracketed areas, and that is this thing called a parameter. So I've got all of these different ways of turning the lights on and off, but you'll see there's no actual on or off in any of that. If I wanted that, I'd have to have two commands, which wouldn't be ideal. Um, you don't want to have to do this twice. It's just not not yeah, sensible. So you can have a parameter, which is a variable. So you can set that up, and I've set that up to be a string. There's many different types here. Actually, this isn't as mature. This is where I was saying that, that Percept's still quite new. If you're doing something like the Alexa one, these uh, types here, um, there's, there's maybe, I think on the, on the Alexa, there might be 10 of those or 12 even. Um, uh, we're quite limited here, but this is, this is enough. And you can then specify what the values of that variable can be on or off in our case you can, you can have a um, a default value as well but i mean there's no default I either want it on or off you can't guess for me so that, that gets fed back in here so it knows that when you get turned the light it's then going to expect uh that variable a version of that to either be on or off and it knows that and it stores it so 
that's the top level of, of that. Now, you, you asked the question of what happens when you press that change command. When you press change command, it deploys this version of the project that I'm working on here to the percent, although I think that's a little bit of a gray area. Let's just say it's, it uses this version of a model from that point on. The reason why I say it's a gray area is that it happens almost instantaneously, and there's no way that that's the case. Uh, I think it, it's just updating the, the wake word down here, and it's sending a lot of it up personally. But again, I'm happy to, to be corrected on that. Um, a lot of this isn't open uh, directly, but um, yeah, that, that's, that's my understanding. Anyway. Um, what we've got there at that point then is the command and the variables, but we haven't spoken about what it does with it. So we mentioned if this, then that earlier. Um, and uh, what we use for that is something called a web endpoint. And I'm using the same method here for an Azure function. So a web endpoint is just a way for the command to hit an HTTP endpoint with some data to be able to trigger the rest of whatever your workflow is. Uh, and once you've done this, this is when you start needing code, of course. Um, is uh, Real quick question, is that the yeah, same yeah, thing yeah. as a webhook? That's exactly what it is, yeah. Yep. Uh, I think that, in fact, uh, that is probably what it's called in If This and That is a webhook, in fact. Um, so, yeah, it just sends out the data, and we'll see how that works in a little minute. Uh, so that, I've uh, created one here. There's a, a parameter at the bottom down there uh, to be able to dial into my Azure function. But this is the HTTP endpoint for the Azure function I've created. Um, and what it does then is when it receives this sentence and the necessary parameter, it calls this done, this completion rule here. And the action is call that web endpoint. And if I go in and edit that, then it sends some really basic JSON here of the state and then the value of that variable. I know that all I'm doing with my Azure function is controlling a lamp, so I don't need to tell it what device I'm controlling here. All I need to know is that it's going to go on or off. Um, and then if it's successful, then it'll speak back to me that the light has been turned on or off, depending on which one we chose. And if it fails, it'll say it failed. Um, and I'll just leave that there because we'll come back to that. So if we switch across to some code, and I'm not going to do any coding because I'm nowhere near that brave, uh, but I've already got all of this code deployed to Azure and also to my Raspberry Pi. And this is the um, the Azure code. Now, I'm not going to go through it in, in great detail, um, but we've got a bunch of using statements at the top um, and a service client, and this is what's going to be doing the heavy lifting of talking to the IoT Hub. If you remember, we go from the Azure function to the IoT Hub and then down to the Raspberry Pi at that point. Uh, and then we have a connection string, uh, which I'm not showing you for obvious reasons. Um, and then we have an HTTP trigger for the Azure function. And what's great is a lot of this is actually um, uh, uh, automatically just boilerplated for you when you create an HTTP triggered Azure function. Uh, and I've just added into that the bits that I need. So uh, I think pretty much all of that actually is boilerplated for you as far as I remember. So it calls in. And a blob of JSON comes in, and I spit that out onto the onto the, the console, and then I convert it to an object, and then I spit that out onto the console, and then I have a response message that I use in a little minute. But underneath all of this, which is literally just grabbing the JSON and sticking it out onto the console, then I create this service client here, which is connecting to the IoT hub. You need a service level permission. That's why it's called a service client. Um, the Raspberry Pi needs a device connect level permission. Uh, so there's different permissions in IoT Hub. If you don't know what IoT Hub, by the way, uh, we've been speaking about that, then that is like a telephone switchboard for IoT devices. You can have millions of IoT devices communicating directly to the IoT Hub and they'll never get a busy signal. Um, and it's a two-way comms-based thing. So if you know a little bit about Azure and you've used Event Hub, it's like Event Hub, but it's two-way, uh, whereas Event Hub is one-way. Uh, once you get devices and communications into IoT Hub, then you can hook it into the rest of Azure and you, you're laughing at that point. So that that's what the, the, the central point of all of this technology is, is that uh, Azure service. It's great and uh, I like it. Um, so once we've connected the client, you see I've passed in the connection string, then we invoke a method. Now, what, what we're using here is something called direct methods, uh, which is an IoT Hub um, uh, term that we were able to invoke a function directly on the Raspberry Pi, and we'll see that code in a minute. And that's what this does. So I'm invoking uh, this method async down here, um, and I'm passing in the state of either on or off. 
And just here, I'm saying I want to create a new direct method call, and that direct method will be called control light. And there's a control light function, uh, a partner to that on the Pi that we'll see in a second. <clears throat> and then we got a response uh, timeout um, because that's sensible for IoT st stuff. We set the module payload JSON. So what do we want to send with this command? Uh, and I just send that same blob of JSON essentially uh, with the, the state on or off in it. Uh, and then we wait for a response and stick that out to the console. And then we return that response message I created above back to the um, to the percept so that it can trigger uh, these on success or on failure um, uh, scenarios here. But you can see there's not much I'm sending. And actually, when you look at it, there's not that much code. If I, if I took all of the logging out there, there wouldn't be that much code at all. Um, so here we've got from the percept through all of the speech services out through that speech uh, studio custom command through that webhook, web endpoint, HTTP endpoint, blah, 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 out uh, to an Azure function. And now the Azure function is going to call a method on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is connected to the same IoT hub and it's sitting there and it's waiting. And the code for that is also relatively simple. Um, we have a device connection string. So that's like a partner. So that's the, uh, the connection string that it's using to be able to authenticate with the IoT hub. Uh, I've set up a variable for which pin on the Raspberry Pi. Now the Raspberry Pi has got a bunch of pins, 40 along one side called GPIO, General Purpose Input Output. And one of those pins, pin 32, um, is connected to the relay to turn that uh, main socket on or off. So not much use for GPIO here, just a single pin. Uh, we control GPIO using this GPIO controller, which is the um, uh, device. G oh, she's listening now down here. Shush. Uh, Add your fallback message here. Oh, no, I don't want to. I heard, I heard you say um, controller. That that's what. Yeah, I did. yeah, yeah. yeah. In my run through, I was doing that, and I thought I must not say that but the that word. So that word there, look, uh, that's going to be doing all of my my heavy lifting of driving the GPIO, the general purpose input output, and that uses this system device GPIO NuGet package. Um, there's another great one as well as a device bindings NuGet package, and somebody's written a whole heap of code to control devices like I/O expanders and servos and stuff like that. Um, but this one here, this will let you uh, interact with all of the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. I mean, this is C sharp end to end. All of this code C sharp. Uh, well, maybe not the services that are probably C underneath, but uh, we don't need to worry about them. Uh, I open a pin just to say you're an output uh, for that particular uh, lamp or uh, light pin, and I set it high to begin with. Uh, setting it high will turn the light off, so this just defaults to to making sure the light's off when it starts. Uh, then we have this device client here. And this is where I'm connecting to IoT Hub, passing that device connection string, and I'm using a protocol called MQTT. Uh, you could use MQTT or AMQP, and both of these are um, communications protocols that are well used, well known in an IoT world. If you can't use that for whatever reason, you could also use HTTPS or either of these two uh, using WebSockets. Uh, it could be that 8883, I think it is, uh, for MQTT, that port is often blocked on corporate networks. Uh, so if it is, you can fall back and down to, to something that you can use. Here is my method handler for that control light function. So you remember here, I'm creating a, uh, a cloud to device method for control light. And this is its accompaniment on the Raspberry Pi. So once I register that, it knows that it needs to execute this code when it receives that direct method. It's quite clever, really. I mean, it's not hard in any way, really, just once you know how to do this, then you can create as many of those methods as you like and, and call them and do different things. Um, it, it passes in uh, a method request and in, in there is the data that I'm passing in. Um, so we know that there's not very much in that. That's just got this state on off, um, although I recreated it in the Azure function, but it's, it comes out to be the same anyway, state on off. And then I deserialize that into an object, which is pretty much exactly what I did in the Azure function. And then some very basic code here. If it's on, then I set that pin value to low. So it seems a bit backwards, but um, the relay will work that way. So I need to set that pin to low to turn it on. Uh, and if it's not on, then I need to set it to high to turn it back off again. It's a bit backwards, but... Yeah, so I, I'm just glad to know that, that you have the same issue with these relays that I do. I would have figured it'd be the other way. And <laughs> so, so, you know, whenever I open the pin, the very first thing I have to do is set high so that, you know, it doesn't 
change from the normal, you know, normal close or normal open position to the other one. Yep. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of this, a lot of the reasoning behind so this is that certainly on a, on a Raspberry Pi, if you think of this the other way around, I've got another demo that, that I just demo how these, uh, I think, in fact, somebody in the chat, um, oh, I think it was uh, Visual Studio mentioning about the, the GPIO libraries. Uh, and I, I give a good introduction about how this all works and explain more about GPIO. But um, just to be brief, the pins on the Raspberry Pi are what's called open collector. So they'll often float around. So that's great. But if you if you read that input, for instance, then you wouldn't know if it's high or low because it's just floating there. So you've got to tie it off to a direction. And then what happens is if you've got, say, a button on the other end of that, then if you've tied it high, which is what I tend to do, um, then you press the button and it goes low. So at that point, everything seems backwards because you're kind of grabbing that to low. But you can do it the other way around to make it work a bit better. But certainly my convention, at least, is to tie it high and then pull it low. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yep. Uh, actually, in the Raspberry Pi, you've got normally you'd need a resistor externally to do that uh, because otherwise it's bad. You're just connecting high to low and don't do that. Uh, inside the Raspberry Pi, there's what's called pull-up resistors, which is why I tend to go that way. And you can turn them on. Um, not something that that I've needed to do here because I've not got a button. But yeah, that, that just gives you some of the background about that. And I realise we're at ten two, so we're about done actually, as it happens. Uh, so I'd say on or off, and then I've got a response message that I send back with an HTTP response code of 200. And that means that the Azure function then knows that this is okay. And that's how, uh, if we go back to this code, let's see, it's got that response timeout. It's waiting for that 200 to know that it's it's done that. So uh, you, you're kind of at the end of that, that line there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show my uh, camera again, just there, and I'm going to see if it works. Um, which we know at least it responds to the wait word, uh, but I've got the Raspberry Pi code running and I've got the Azure function running, and then I'll cycle back and just show what they're showing after hopefully it worked. So let's see, controller. Turn the lamp on. Add your fallback uh, message here. Controller, turn the lamp on. The <laughs> light has been turned on. Woohoo! That was good. And then controller, turn the lamp off. The light has been turned on. Uh, so that was the percept to an Azure, well, to Speech Studio, really, uh, to an Azure function, to IoT Hub, to a Raspberry Pi, to a mains relay, to the lump on and off. And if I switch back to my browser, we can very quickly have a look at what that looked like from the, um, uh, if I go to invocations here, refresh that. Uh, all being well. Oh, I might need to refresh that screen because it's probably timed out. We can have a look at the basics of what that looked like. I should have started those logs running just before that, but um, I stupidly forgot. Uh, come on, you can, you can do it. Uh, what's great about Azure Functions is that you don't need to have those logs running. You'll actually get it here. Uh, but here we are. So this would be the last one of those two. Should we just turn off this one? But I can click that and we get the message. And there we are. So that's that state off that you can see that little blob of JSON and you can see that it's happy. And I've also SSH'd into my Raspberry Pi and there's that little bit of code showing you that I turned it on and back off. And, you know, that's pretty much the end of that uh, section. I've got some like little bits and bobs that I want to mention, if you don't mind. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That, yes, absolutely. That's, that's the link to my uh, the, the, the Twitch channel that I run with Jonathan Ralph from Lee and Gulliver. Uh, and a few others have has got shows on there, and that's IoT Live that myself, Cliff Aegis, and uh, Maria Anastasia Mustaka, um, we talk about IoT stuff that's happened in the week, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, British summertime at the moment, GMT, later in the year. Uh, and also, if you want to get a bit more serious about um, the Azure IoT stack, myself and a few uh, authors have created a whole learning path to be able to help you pass the AZ220 IoT developer certification. Uh, so go and check that out. And here's the links to all of the stuff I've been talking about today. Um, and we can no doubt put these in the chat um, as well. I can uh, I can paste them in for you to look at. But there's a blog post that details exactly step by step how to, to get this working for yourself. Um, and there's a GitHub repo with all of the code in it. And then um, a very similar link to a page that uh, slightly different to the page that you showed earlier about the percept just there and then some more information about the speech services and custom vision and so on and then uh, if you want to get in touch with me then um, you can do that there many different ways and the slides are available at that bit.ly at the bottom and that's it now we'll stop
<laughs> Cam had left for some moderation. Oh, so. I offended him with my uh, self promotion. That's what it was. No, no. <laughs> I'm not sticking around for this. <laughs> oh no, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, one for being on the show, but two for also uh, y- your efforts with Plural Site. You know, I know that oh, Plural Site, you know, authoring stuff there is a lot of work, and uh, I know that a lot of people benefit from that. So thank you so much. And then for the Twitch show, like you're you're all over the place. This is great. This has been awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. It's good. No, it, it's really actually kind of timely. I mean, not only is it IoT Month here for for all of our .NET community um, goings on, like uh, the streams and whatnot, but we're uh, we've we're actually in the process of creating a Microsoft Learn module that gets a lot of what you talked about today. Um, that that uh, how to build a Raspberry Pi based device that can not only flip uh, flip a bit off and on like you were with that LED, but that can also read environmental conditions from a uh, from a sensor. Um, mm-hmm. There's actually if if anybody wants to learn about IoT Hub Azure IoT Hub, there's a Microsoft Learn module out there. I, I don't know the link right off the top of my head, but you can search for it. It's um, it basically sets up this scenario where you're a you work for a cheese company and you have a cave where you want to monitor the conditions in this cave, and and they set up like a virtual device, just like a software based device to to get you through the the IoT hub part of it. I'm actually writing uh, right now a .NET based module to build the actual device to send do the 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 sensing and the and the um, the the bit twiddling for the fan. So. Um, it, stay tuned. The, the the I was the reason I dropped was my browser typed up as I was typing the docs URL, but I'm gonna type the the URL again. If you are interested in this kind of stuff, um, we have documentation to get you going. Um, it's all geared toward these little guys, these Raspberry Pis. These are ubiquitous and inexpensive and can get you going very quickly. Well, harder at the moment. Chip shortage has meant that it's difficult to get the blooming things, but yeah. Fair. <laughs> but everybody's got one. It's probably in a drawer. You just have to pull it out and use it. <laughs> that's, that's really funny you say that because that's, uh, I've got a drawer full of IoT stuff. It's, <laughs> it sits there. It's it's so much fun to like play with and set up. And then it's like, well, what am I going to actually do with it? So I've got some ideas for future stuff, but. Yeah, that's that's what Microsoft are heading towards doing. I think they're going to try and and Cam, you're you're obviously part of that. Is that they want to show you how to be able to get to production? Um, because yeah, you're right. There's lots of these little dots, stars, if you will, and they're trying to draw lines between them to show how you actually go about productionizing some of this. I guess so. And that's yeah, a great great thing that they're going to do. Yeah, shocked you there. Shocked, shocked yeah, no, I was just. Uh... <laughs> So, so, uh, Luis, is that, is that, are, are we, are we going to close it down now? I think so. Yeah. I mean, this was tons of, uh, really, really great content and make sure to check out the links that Pete has on here. If you have additional questions, um, next week, again, we're going to keep going with the IOT theme. Uh, we want to, you know, thank you folks for joining us today. Um, and make sure to check out the recordings, right? If, you know, maybe you missed part of this presentation or even ones from previous weeks, uh, make sure to check those out. Uh, next week, we have uh, Clifford, whom you may have heard mention here, uh, that he's building his own plane. So <laughs> uh, next week, though, he's going to be talking to us about building 3D printed arms. Wait, wait, this um, is that same guy? It yes. Is. Oh, so, we can, awesome. pl- so yeah. we can ask about the plane. So we can ask about the plane, too. You could ask about the plane. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's going to be talking to us uh, about building 3D printed arms uh, and how you can do that with, with IoT um, and all the different uh, Azure set of technologies. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so with that, thanks again, Pete. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye friends. <laughs>